we have this new tradition of starting every every uh, meeting with a production horror story, and mine was the start of my career. Um, the first job I ever had, I was working. Uh, I got hired to be a PA on a low-budget film, and uh, they asked me in the interview, "Do you know how to drive a motorhome?" And I said, "Of course I do." <laughs> And uh, the first week was uneventful. Everything went fine, driving through the worst parts of LA in the middle of the night in a motorhome, and it was fine. Uh, then we hit the road out to, we were shooting outside of Las Vegas. And uh, in Ontario, uh, I didn't see any warning lights. I did see the oil gauge going down and the temperature going up. And then a trucker pulled up next to me, honking his horn and waving telling me this. And I'm like, hi? And then the first flames licked over the front of the vehicle, <laughs> over the windshield. Uh, we pulled over, pulled everybody off. Everybody got their stuff out of the motorhome. Uh, we were traveling in motorhomes as a group out to Las Vegas because it was that low budget. Um, the truckers pulled over and put out the fire. The firemen arrived. The other motorhome pulled over, and our eight people got into their motorhome that already had eight people, and so we had 16 people in a motorhome going out to Las Vegas, which was delightful. Uh, we get out to Las Vegas, they get me a replacement motorhome. The day it arrives, I'm driving out to set with a group of mostly the same eight people, and because of a short and a small electrical fire, I lose uh, power and have to pull over basically on a dirt road in the middle of the desert. Radioed in, got rides to the set. So two motorhome fires. On the drive home, I had been driving the nice new replacement that they brought out. On the drive home, the production manager comes to me and says, um, you know how the producer's nephew is driving one of the motorhomes? He wants to drive yours, so you're gonna drive his. And I'm like, I will drive the crappy one if you guarantee that you do not leave me here when this thing catches fire. He says, I guarantee it. Driving, we were in Needles at this point, driving up out of Needles on this big long hill, the, the vehicle is going slower and slower and slower. The other motorhome passes me, all the vehicles pass me. The last one to pass me is the motorhome with the production manager and the transport coordinator and they're both just facing directly forward, not making eye contact. <laughs> My motorhome catches on fire, we pull off, it puts itself out, and we are, and it's, we realize that it's the same eight people who were in both the other motorhome fires. And two of the guys were so pissed off that they just started tearing apart the motorhome. And then the other six people went, that's a great idea. So when the police officer arrives, <laughs> all these people are tearing apart the motorhome. And I get out of the, out of the motorhome and I go back to the police officer and I, and I say, um, here's the situation. This is our third motorhome that we've been in, third one that's caught on fire. These people are pissed off at the production company and want them to pay for it. The cop goes, all right, uh, after they're done, do you have a place to stay? Do you want me to call somebody? I'm like, you're gonna let us get away with this? She goes, oh sure, no problem. <laughs> so we have a friend pick us up and take us back to Needle and Needles in three trips. And the next day, I come back to civilization, resting in a van on top of the motorcycles that were laid down flat for us to lay on. So that's my first production horror story. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So last month it was a horror story on trains. This month it's in moving vehicles. I don't want to get on a plane. With you. <laughs> I'm not on a plane with you. For the record, uh, since last month was on trains and this month is on uh, motorhomes, Mike does not want to get on a, a plane with me. Very nice. Um, so welcome. Uh, I'm Mike Brugemeyer. I'm president of. Uh, MCAI San Diego, uh, San Diego Media Pros is our, our moniker now. Um, we are the local chapter of Media Communications Association International. 
Like us on San Diego Media San Diego Media Pros on Facebook. Follow SD Media Pros on Twitter, and uh, on the web at sdmediapros.org. We are in the process of uh, redoing our website, and we're making great progress at it. It's turning out really nice. We still have uh, some tweaks before we can switch it over, but we're really encouraged by how it's turning out. Um, we wouldn't be here without our sponsors and our our um, most loyal sponsor and our our my favorite sponsor is video gear uh martin banks and his crew at video gear do a great job of supporting mcai but more importantly they do a great job of supporting video media professionals in san diego no matter what association you belong to um, the I, I was meeting with a gentleman earlier this week and he wants to do videos for himself he wants to be able to walk into somebody's office and set up a camera and set up a microphone and record interviews <clears throat> and the first thing i told him is those videos won't turn won't turn out very good but you can try and he says well what do i need to do and i said you need to get some folks on your team and you need to call the folks at Video Gear because the folks at Video Gear are going to give you very, very good recommendations on the particular kind of camera that's going to work best for you. And uh, he said, why can't I just ask you? And I said, you can ask me, but I don't know everything that they know. So San Diego, Video Gear is, for me, a, a resource for answers. In addition to a place where I can rent equipment and buy equipment, there are resources for answers. So thank you, Video Gear, for supporting MCI. Uh, uh, yeah, he called me, and that's why he called you. <clears throat> um, I also want to give a huge thank you to the Godfather Restaurant. Uh, the Godfather restaurant is responsible for all of our wonderful food that we ate and continue to eat this evening. Um, thank you to them for that because that's there's so much food that Mark continues to eat. Um, and, and I'm going to have some again as well. Um, and then and then Kenny, Eddie. Oh, Eddie. That's my brother. Really? Yeah, you got that one right. I would like to introduce Kenny's brother, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> who is uh, our our uh, ambassador here at Vision Pulse Studios. Yeah, this is great. Do you want to come up and, and tell us a little bit about Oh uh, shucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. I, I saw on the web that you have offices for that are uh, the th the, when I looked at the website, the thing that I thought was especially cool is that as a freelancer, there are occasionally times where I'm going to have clients who want to come to my office. And my office is currently in my dining room. And I don't want them in my dining room. So this is a perfect place for me to uh, call and get an office right away and get a conference room and have a place that clients can come to me. That looks like a studio. That looks like a studio. Here you are. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and uh, for the guys mostly, how many of you, when you have an office out of your house, still have your socks and your underwear laying on the floor? <laughs> okay, so, and you don't want to have to pick those up, right? They're dirty. Um, so you come here, you got a nice clean office for about the price of a Starbucks, a latte for you and a guest is like 10 bucks, right? So for eight bucks an hour, we've got office suites, we have conference rooms, and then also we have this auditorium. Uh, I don't want to confuse, it's not $8 for the auditorium, but it's close. Um, it's a membership type program, kind of like joining a gym, and then you get to use the space whenever you want. If you're not a member, you can also use the space. But we hold a lot of different kinds of events here and functions, everything from accounting and engineering boring seminars to some wild animal acts and parties and, and you guys. This is the wild animal act, right? <laughs> Show me! Where's the energy? Okay, uh, we also have, I'm, I don't want to take up too much time because I see there's a hook out there someplace. Um, but we do have another project in the works, so how many of you out there are production-oriented people? Oh, I got the right audience. Excellent. How many of you want to make money? And doing it legally? 
<laughs> okay. Well, good. We're working on some cooperative projects here where we're looking for teams and production teams and of all sorts to be able to collaborate and put on some deals here to not only have office space, casting space, location space, production studio, et cetera, et cetera. And that's one of the reasons why we're hosting you here is to network and get to know you, you get to know us, and I got some ideas. And most of it's legal. <laughs> exactly, that's the key word. Anything else? How many, how many uh, seats can be put in here? Ah. How large are the people? Legally, uh, <laughs> legally normal sized people. Um, a lot of the stuff in this whole building moves. I've kind of designed it like it's a sound stage. So don't let the space as it, you see it deceive you. We have a stage behind me right here. It moves, it's on wheels. Sometimes we set it up on the sidewall, sometimes we take it out in the parking lot. The bar is also on wheels. We're also uh, remodeling our upstairs balcony and we'll be able to have seating up there. So for theater style seating, depending upon the configuration, but we can easily, easily seat 100 people in here. We've done it already. Um, if we move the stage out, we move the bar out, we have people sitting up there, it'll probably be close to 200. And we've held parties for over a thousand. I need, I need, a, I need a card before I can... <laughs> it, you're sitting on it. <laughs> you're keeping it warm. Very cool. Thank you. All right, and I want to say thank you because uh, you have also supported our, the production community uh, prior to hosting us here. Um, uh, Vision Pulse Studios uh, uh, offered to help some filmmakers from the, the 48 hour film project last year. And they also host other events for filmmakers groups, including one tomorrow. Why, thank you, Mike, for that shameless plug there. Uh, there is a gentleman that uh, got dragged off to church this evening, Charles Reed. I don't know how many of you know him, but he's a producer director here in town. And he has a group that meets about once a quarter, and they're meeting here tomorrow for directors and producers that need to network and need to establish um, some help back and forth. Uh, so Charles Reed, tomorrow night here at Vision Pulse. And yes, we are once again sponsoring the 48-hour film project. Yes. Thank you. So, um, yes, you may. Please come up. Hi, I'm Connie Terwilliger. Hi, Connie. And uh, I just wanted to announce that uh, we're going to be in uh, Las Vegas. Let me stand back a little bit because the microphone is squealing. Uh, on <clears throat> Tuesday, April the 9th, in uh, Las Vegas during NAB, we're going to be having a media pro camp in the afternoon and a media festival screening party in the evening at around five o'clock and a leadership meeting in the morning and then the previous afternoon there's going to be a board meeting. So if you haven't made plans uh, and, and, you do, and you do plan to be in Las Vegas for NAB, you might wanna check us out on Tuesday. It's all on the website, on the calendar, you can go there, but the uh, big news is that we have a new uh, benefit uh, as of today. Uh, we have, uh, we're part of a, a new, uh, a new hotel discount program uh, for business travel through CLC, and there's links on the website now for that. 20 to 40 percent, if they can't find the lowest rate for you, they'll give you 30 bucks the next time. And uh, there's a link on the private, private page of the website where you can um, sign up and you save a $10 on the, on the um, membership or the sign up fee that's, that's uh, eliminated for MCAI members. So that's another benefit of MCAI. I don't know if there's any rooms left at, in Las Vegas when coming up in two weeks, but you might be able to, maybe you could try. Thank you very, very much, Connie. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we are starting meetings with horror stories and uh, tics, tips and tricks. If you have any horror stories or tips and tricks, send them to president at sdmca-i.org. Uh, the main reason I want you to send me these things is I don't have enough for the whole year. <laughs> uh, so here are uh, the, the uh, tips for uh, this month. Um, for creativity, you might want to try writing in this process. 
make a paragraph of a concept. And then once you get, you can write three or four paragraphs, just kernels of ideas. And, and once you write one, set it aside and clear your brain and write another. Get three or four, four or five, however many you can come up with. Pick the best ones, one or two or three, and then move forward with those. Um, write a longer treatment of those and see which ones actually work for you. And then the one that works for you, go ahead and write the script from that. <clears throat> uh, for producing, when scouting locations, bring a checklist with you. Actually pay attention to the checklist. Is there electricity available? How is the sound? Are there airports nearby? Train tracks? Parking? In the excitement of looking, you may forget to pay attention to everything, so bring the list. I'm telling you this out of experience. I have made this mistake so many times, and now I have a list that I carry with me. Uh, directing. <clears throat> the real winning in directing is in pre-production. The director is leading the cast and crew on a journey to the finished story. The clearer he knows what he wants to end up with, the clearer he can be with cast and crew. And that clarity comes by telling the story in your head before you ever begin making a movie. If you can see the shots, if you can tell the story in cinematic bits before you start, then you can pass that information to the crew and cast effectively, and they will all appreciate the... the lack of time wasting, lack of effort wasting that you have because you're just getting the things that you already know you're going to put into the story. Cinematography. Back up a lot. When I shoot interviews, I shoot interviews probably around 20 feet away. The reason I do that is because I want to separate my talent, separate my on-camera person from their, their background, and backing up and zooming in shortens your depth of field. Uh, you may need a wireless microphone, you may need a longer microphone cable, but back the camera up, you end up with prettier results. It also feels like you're, you're <laughs> eavesdropping a little bit when you hear, when you are that far away from the talent. Uh, equipment, sandbags, Christmas lights, and duvetine. I always end up using sandbags for things other than the traditional use of a sandbag. I end up putting a camera on it. I end up using it for a doorstop or an, an actor's mark. Sandbags are valuable, for, not just for being sandbags. Christmas lights, they're great in the background. They're also great in the foreground, in between you and the talent. They're a really cool uh, lighting thing. But they're also great in the dashboard of a car to light a little bit of fill light on your actor. They're great um, in a pinch, in a low light situation, as your key light. You can just hold up a bunch of lights in front of the talent and shoot, and you can end up with some decent results. And duvetine. Anytime you want to make something look a little more dramatic, you can add darkness. And darkness is what duvetine is about. It's black fabric. So if you want to, if you have a scene outside which is overly lit, you can put duvetine up in front of the actor or the talent and end up with a bright side and a dark side as opposed to a very evenly lit scene. Editing. For color correcting, here's a trick that I use. I apply a color correction filter and hit the auto button. Okay? Auto, auto leveling for whites and blacks. And then I apply another one and I do my color correction with that filter. So then, when I want to color correct other things, I copy both those filters, apply it to everything, and on each of those new clips, I go in and hit the auto button again on that piece of footage. It resets my whites and blacks, and then kind of levels the playing field so that the second one actually applies the look to a, a, an image that's similar to the first one. So it basically evens out all your footage before you apply your color correction. I never, ever <laughs> let footage out of my editing system without color correcting it. And the other thing that happens is I spend way too much time messing with it. Um, compositing. In After Effects, if you're compositing using motion tracking, remember to use motion blur. For example, if you're putting uh, a screen on a phone and the person's moving it around, remember to use motion blur so that the image that's being tracked onto the phone blurs. But 
if you've ever had situations where motion blur doesn't, or uh, where motion tracking doesn't work well and you have to dial it in from frame to frame, be sure to use your position tools. Uh, be sure to move the position of it before you move, before you do the, the corner pinning. And the reason for that is if you just apply the corner pins as you motion track, you're not going to get motion blur. If you move it with your position controls, the motion blur will show up. And then you can corner pin. Uh, voiceover. When sending out files, use the title of the project and your name. When a producer goes back months later to figure out who did that awesome VO, all they have to do is look at the file and they'll see your name. Uh, composing. The best composers know that their role is an accompanist, that they aren't the soloist. And when you hear music that is a solo, it's probably not going to work with the story because the story is the soloist. Okay, so if you have tips, tricks, or production stories, please send them to president at sdmcai.org. Um, on uh, April 27th and 28th, Photo Video West, Photo Video Expo West, the largest photo show on the West Coast, is coming to the Del Mar Fairgrounds. We are going to have a booth, thanks to the very nice people at Photo Video Expo West. They are donating booth space to us so we can, we can uh, promote our members and get more members. So I, wanna, I want to say thank you to them, but also to encourage you to come out and check out what they've got going. They have a, a, they're trying to make more of an effort in uh, including video into this event. And uh, they, they are working toward making it a half and half event. Right now, it, there's a lot of focus on the photo stuff, but they're, they're uh, making a concerted effort to get uh, more involvement from the video folks. Are you bringing Orange County in? I haven't spoken with Orange County. I would love to bring them in. Um, I will contact them. What were the dates? April 27th and 28th. I'll be there both days. It's indoors, so I won't need sunscreen, and I'm very happy about that. Because I don't burn, I cancer. <laughs> and now, the reason we are all here tonight. I have been looking forward to this meeting ever since I found out that Marianne had a way to wrestle this talented gentleman here. I'm so thrilled to have you come and speak. Um, uh, Stephen Metcalf will be speaking with us tonight. He is the, uh, the wonderful screenwriter of um, Man, Cousins. You remember the movie Cousins? Ted Danson, Isabella Rossellini? Oh, great film, wonderful story. Um, arachnophobia, it could happen to you, the air up there, Mr. Holland's Opus, The Marrying Man, Dangerous Minds, Roommates, and Pretty Woman. Um, I'm so glad you're here, and I can't wait to have you come up here and speak, that I'm going to give you the microphone right now. Stephen Metcalf. Oh. I don't know what to say. Um, hmm. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm listening and I'm, I'm hearing all the, these, uh, this remarkable, quote unquote, technical jargon, which I know nothing about. Um, I got into this crazy business. I was um, in college. I got into the uh, theater program as an actor. Uh, by my junior year, I was directing. By my senior year, I decided oh, I, I need to write a play. Um, I did that. I, I went to, uh, I took all of one semester uh, in the MFA program at Boston University as an actor, and I hated it so intensely. And uh, I left. And it's interesting, you know, uh, you, you've gone through a, a college situation where you're with all these different people, and all of a sudden you're by yourself, and it's like, you have a you have a, a ball but nobody to play with so I started writing at that point sort of seriously uh, 
I moved to New York City in 1976 with the intention of, you know, of writing for the theater, uh, maybe acting, maybe directing, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I, I feel like, I've always feel like I've, I was very, very fortunate. I, 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 get, I got plays done early on. So when we talk about film, everything, you know, my whole sensibility comes from the background of somebody who started off in the theater. Um, I do not believe I would have a career today in the movie business. I really have to tell you that. Um, at, at, at the point when I entered, well, I should just say, in about 1985, I had a couple of plays done off Broadway. Um, I had an agent, and somebody said, would, would, would Stephen like to try to rewrite a screenplay? And it was a non-WGA job. And, I, and they said, oh, well, you know, it's only $12,000. And I, went, I just about fell off the chair. And I said, oh, God, yes, please. And uh, I went and wrote a screenplay. And I had never written one. I had no idea about the format. I had no idea about anything. I, in fact, I, I remember going to uh, a bookstore in Manhattan trying to find screenplays. I couldn't find any. I remember I, the only thing I found was William Goldman's Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, which, believe me, believe you, it, it, that was not the best way to start reading that one. He, he ignored every single convention of screenwriting. Um, so what I went and I did a rewrite on, a, on a, somebody else's screenplay, and people seemed to like it, and they asked me to do another one. And so I did that. And then at that point, I thought, well, maybe I should try to do this myself. And I took one of my own plays, and I wrote a screenplay based on a play, which uh, was, became the movie Jackknife. And again, it, it, when I look at it, it is so, it, it is so amateurish. And, but maybe the story shines through. And I, I, I can keep going back to that, the importance of story, the importance of story, the importance of story. But uh, you know, all of a sudden, uh, I, I suddenly had a career going, and it, I never expected that. Um, so, I, I, I guess my point being is that I've, I totally have always come to uh, to, to writing movies. To, to to everything I did was always based on the idea of story and of character, and to some extent of dialogue. I got hired a lot to do production rewrites, meaning people felt pretty confident about what they had in terms of the structure of a story, what they wanted to do. They didn't feel that maybe the characters have been quite rash, you know, realized as yet. They didn't feel like the dialogue was what they wanted as yet. And so somebody coming out of the theater, that was something that I found pretty, pretty easy to do. Um, and so now I say that I don't think I get hired anymore. Uh, I, what I would do is I'd be hired, I'd be hired in television. Uh, if I was doing it these days. Movies to me have not, have become something that is not about, in many, <laughs> I shouldn't, there are no absolutes, are there? But um, most, you know, studio movies to me these days are not about character, they're not about, you know, the fine points of story, they are about spectacle. Uh, television to me is more than ever about character, and it is about dialogue, um, about you know you know characters moving forward, and so it's a totally different thing. Um, what was I saying? <laughs> uh, it's it's very very interesting. I mean, it it it, it seems to me now you, you talk about. Um, Movies to me are more and more and more and more a director's medium. I think they always have been because of this director who takes it from, you know, word one and moves it through two years later to finish. I, I cannot tell you how many times I've involved, been involved with a, a film where I put in three, four, five, six months and then I moved on to something else. And Two years later, three years later, all of a sudden the movie came out and it changed considerably. And the one constant was the producer and it was the director. I always tell people that the easiest thing in, in a film is to rewrite the screenplay. And there's a reason for that. 
is that movies take so long to get made in the context of Hollywood that the one thing people can always say is, well, hey, we're working on the script. Uh, they can go to a director and say, it's not quite where you want it to be yet, but we're working on it, and if you have ideas that you would like to throw at us, great. You know, very, very rarely is it the script is set. Do you want to do this? <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way when, they, when you go to an actor. The script is set in stone. Uh-uh. It's not like the theater where this is the script. Do you want to do the script? I, I always equate, um, when people ask me the difference between theater and film, um, in the theater, you have written something, you've created something, you've created a house. And what you do is you rent the house. People can decorate it. You know, they can kind of change the carpets. They can do any kind, anything like that they want to do. But boy, they sure can't do much more than that. In movies, they buy the house, which means that they can tear it down to the absolute foundations and do anything they want with it at all. Um, the movies is not a it, it, film is, to me is not a writer's game, and I realize this more and more and more as I've gotten older. It's just it's not. Um, when I started, there was a sense of, uh, I wouldn't call it integrity, but everybody, you sort of knew where you stand. It was it, about 19, late 1990s, all of a sudden, I, it, it, I was told I'd been hired to do something, but they'd also hired other writers to do the same thing at the same time. And it was like, what, what happened? What, huh? You mean you've hired me, but you've hired somebody else? Um, for those of you who are directors, I, I, if you ever get into a situation where you're given something, um, I would suggest the first thing you say is that I want to read every draft that has ever been written on this script. Because what has started, I think, to happen is that it's, it's no longer about preserving what's the best thing about a story. It's about how do I stake claim on this story. Uh, w when I started writing, you know, pr Pretty Women, for example, um, there was no such thing as DVD royalties. There was no such thing as any of that. And uh, so I remember, <laughs> I'm not sure if you're aware of this, the WGA says uh, you write a letter to them um, saying why you think you deserve credit on a film. And at the, back in, what was it, 1990, out of Pretty Woman, for example, my letter was, I think my work speaks for itself. <laughs> that wasn't a very good idea, okay? Especially when I heard later on that David Rabe, the playwright, wrote like a you know a hundred-page dialogue about why he should have thought every single page was his. And it, my point ultimately being, um, what suddenly happened when royalties became such a huge part for a writer? A writer didn't have anything. There was nothing for him. Th there was no stake in him trying to hold on to what was right about a film. He wanted to change things as much as possible. And I say that to you guys as directors because do you, when you finally step into something, God knows what you've left behind. And I'm all over the map here. Maybe I should just ask, answer questions. Were we going to see a clip or something? Do you want to see clips or do you want? Uh, yes. Okay. I'll go back and sit. <laughs> Uh, do you have an order of which clips you want to see? Yes, when? No difference at all. No, I think we, we're not going to do all of those because I think it would take you know way too long. Okay. Yeah. We have picked out some clips. The first clip is from, from a film called Beautiful Joe. This is from Beautiful Joe. Yes. Do you, do you want to talk about the uh, project at all? Be Beautiful Joe. Um, yes. We're recording on video, so that's okay. That's okay. Be Beautiful Joe was. Uh, Okay, Beautiful Joe. <laughs> uh, I, I think I wrote Beautiful Joe in about 1996, and it was, at this point I had gotten to a point where I'd, I'd written a couple of projects where I said that um, I would like to, I, if this gets done, I want to be the director on it. Um, there is this, this thing about being a writer in Hollywood where you think, oh, well, you know, to control it, I want to direct it. <laughs> anyway, so I thought I want to direct this, and um, we got people together who wanted to finance the film, and we had a horrendous time casting it. Uh, it was in different, 
I wouldn't say the, the character of Joe went through different incarnations. And it, we got to a certain point where all of a sudden we were going to do the film with, um, I even forgot the actress's name. No, not her. Okay. It was somebody else. <laughs> it was a quote unquote, uh, the, the American actress in Three Weddings and a Funeral, um, Andy McDowell. We were going to do it with Andy McDowell, who I had a couple of meetings with. She would have been absolutely wonderful. And we were ready to proceed apace. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, um, it came to the attention of the producers that Sharon Stone was interested in doing the film. And um, how do you explain this? <laughs> Who did the film? <laughs> All, with Sharon Stone involved, the producers came f forth and said, we can put five more million dollars into this production if she does it. Because obviously they were dealing with pre-sales all over the world. And you know she was a big deal. And so I went and had a meeting with her, and it was absolutely disastrous. And I said, no, she, this will never work. And um, she apparently felt that it had not gone well, and so she said, let's do another meeting. And she, I, we went to do another meeting, and she was as seductive as any woman could ever be in a million, billion, quadrillion years. And she said, okay, we think we can do this. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> So we, I went up to uh, Vancouver, you know, this is shooting a film that takes place over the entire United States. And you have to understand how naive I was as, as a director. Um, and I do not believe I got good support from my producers. So a film that takes place starting on the east coast of the United States and ends on the west coast of the United States, we decided we were going to shoot the whole thing in Vancouver, Canada. Great. Um, <laughs> And we got up there and we were doing all sorts of location scouting and trying to make things work. And there was a part of me that thought, yeah, we can make, the, in terms of location and this and that, it's rather, actually a rather remarkable place. You think, okay, yeah, you can make this work. We could make, physically, we could make it work. Um, about two weeks before we're, she's supposed to arrive, she bails. What? She bails. How not bails? She bails. She says she's not doing it. So we all get ourselves together, we're getting ready to go home, and literally about two hours before getting on the airplane, uh, she's back in again. Okay. <laughs> and at this point, I, it's like, okay, going into this, I had this horrible, horrible thought. I should say it's a horrible thought. I had this idiotic thought that I could handle it. That I think, you know, wait, this is going to be good. We will make this work. It will happen. It will be great. It'll happen. The script is in a good place. Okay. Um, so she comes up and let me put it this way. Here's the, here are the things I realized. One is that we, were, we shot 26 locations in 32 days. Nobody ever told me what that was like. Okay, me, you know, and this is in Vancouver, moving back and across Vancouver. We had eight or nine days of uh, night shoots. Nobody thought about the fact that it doesn't get dark in Vancouver till about nine, nine thirty, ten at night, and then is light again at five in the morning. So we were so limited on that, and. Um, at the end of the day, I would just say, I would, I have so much respect for, I do not consider myself, never in a million years would I ever consider myself a film director because I don't have the patience, the focus, the uh, incredible discipline. I would get to a certain point in every day and I would be, I'd literally be like, Fuck it, it's good enough. I want to go home. I am tired of this. Now I have to see the clip. Okay? So when I look at, and I went home so many days, and also, as I say, we, we got in there and I would, I would get two takes on any one. I, I get there every single day with my 
with my DP, and we'd have this beautiful shot list worked out. He was a great guy and very imaginative. And by 11 in the morning, and she hadn't gotten out of her stupid trailer, we would be writing down how can we possibly make the day because we cannot go back. We don't, we're not going into the next day. We have got to make the day. How do we do it? And so invariably, it was like, shoot it one way, two takes, shoot it the other way, two takes, move on. It was so frustrating and I went home so many times just like thinking, wow, we did not get the day. We didn't get it. We did not get the day. That was so frustrating. So I, if, if there's any word of advice I can ever give to anybody, which is that um, be careful what you ask for. You know, you do not want Sharon Stone. You, you, you want a situation that you can at least control and have, have the possibility of controlling. Um, just as a total nine, <laughs> we can tell. We get into the, again, my lovely producers, we had the most important shot scenes in the last two weeks of the shoot. And then the second to last week, that's a Tuesday, I got a call about four in the morning. Sharon Stone's husband has had a heart attack and she has left Vancouver and is hurrying to his side. So we went into what, what is the word? Um, well, there's an insurance word, meaning that, okay, you get a couple of days, the insurance pays for the project. And then at that point, it was like, uh, okay, what do you, you know, we've got to do something and she's not back. So I start madly rewriting scenes that she's in and trying to rewrite her out of the scenes. <laughs> And then what happened, this is what kills me, is then the following Monday, her husband was back at work. He was the editor of a San, San, uh, San Francisco newspaper. She didn't come back to the following Wednesday. So it was like we went a whole week without our lead. Um, so I always tell the story is that I, I don't know why we got into this. This is not what I wanted to talk about. But it's like, care, be careful what you ask for. It could happen. And don't believe you can make it work if you can't make it work. Don't believe it. It's, you know, you've got to have certain controls of a situation. Uh, so, but as my editor said, well, it's a movie. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a movie, okay, yeah. Okay, that's a real beautiful joke. Okay. Well, hey. Remember me? Oh, hello there. Hey. I surely do. Yeah. <laughs> well, you made quite a killing. Oh, you know, look. <laughs> How did you do? Me? Oh, you know, win some, you lose some. It's just recreational for me. I find it relaxing. <laughs> So, you're going to introduce yourself, or do I have to ask? Excuse you? me. My name's Joe. Joe. Well, Joe, where are you from? Dublin, Ireland, originally. Oh. Bronx, Borough, Manhattan. Mm -hmm. More recently. That's New York. Mm. You sure talk nice. Oh. I do lots of things nice. So, what are you going to do with that money you want, Joe? Do you know, I never give it a toss. It's kind of like funny money, you know? Hysterical. Look at this. I might even give us away. Hey, now, there's an idea. Do you have a pen? Indeed, I do. There you are. Do you mind if I use this? Anything I got. What's your name? Hush. Sorry? Oh, it's kind of like a pet name. Apparently, when I was little, I talked kind of a lot. But some people find it endearing. Hush Mason, M A. S O N. Thank you. There you go. I won't be a minute. Okay. Good day, sisters. This is what you do. Bless you. Bless you. What's right? You okay? What'd you do that for? Well, it seemed only fair. I mean, it was just by God's grace that I won in the first place. And I still have enough money left to take you out later, if, if you're willing. What is it that you do, Joe? I'm a florist. Uh, huh? I'm a florist. <laughs> so 
in the flowers. Does that mean we won't be seeing each other again? something. Do I think that your husband and my wife slept together? Thank you. It would have taken me a lot longer. Well, I only have an hour for lunch. Ah, Spuds International. Everything you ever wanted on a potato and more. I think they had one with a Buick on it. Do you think they did? I don't know. Only they know. You don't seem to be upset about it. Sex isn't that big a deal anyway. Sex, whether they had sex or not. Something happened. Hey, I believe in people's freedom of choice. Tish needs to grow up to be her own person. Now, that's me. What people do is their own business. That doesn't apply to marriage. Well, it sounds to me like you have a choice to make. And guess what? You're free to make it. This is great. We hardly know each other, and we're already getting our first argument out of the way. Are you serious about that freedom stuff? Yes. No! Oh! God, I'm so full of shit! I'd like to kill him both! Damn, Tom! I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Sorry, I will pay for it. I'll pay for it. It's my fault. So I will pay for the fish. I broke the fish. I shouldn't have come. No, 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 no. How much? How? Never, never mind. Wait, wait. Please, I'm, uh, I'm very sorry. Oh, it wasn't easy for you to come see me today, was it? Are you okay? No, I'm not okay. That's right. You don't cry, do you? Or hit fish. Oh, God. Ooh, it's easy. So at some point, either now or after the next one, can you talk about the process he used to adapt, because this was a French film, right? Cousin yeah. Cousin Cuisine. Uh, Cousin Cuisine was, well, is, if you've never seen Cousin Cuisine. Um, See, if we can ask you to turn the mic. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, Cousin Cuisine is, is, it's sort of the same story, but it, 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 it's, it, if you were to see it, I think you would feel that it is very, very truncated and a lot is left unexplained. And so when we attempted to do the adaptation, it was like, how do we adopt this story for a, an American sensibility, um, where things need to sort of, you know, for want of a better word, at the time we, we, we talked about that kind of, quote unquote, French sophistication, where, uh, you know, infidelity or this or that was not a big deal. I'm, I don't believe that to be the case, but, the, the film really never seriously addressed the emotional ramifications of what the people were going through in terms of the French film, as far as I'm concerned. And so what we really said is, okay, how do we address the, you know, what's happening with these people, what they're going through, what the emotional ramifications are for them, and at the same time, how do we make it uh, romantic and funny? 
that's pretty much what it was. Um, if you were to compare the two films side by side, you, I think you would feel like the French film is, ver is, as I say, very truncated. It doesn't have as much as, the, uh, as this film does. But l l l let me also say, it's interesting because, uh, again, this goes to the whole idea between writing and directing. Um, I can tell you that in terms of the script, it was, the script was written open air market, okay? Um, they're moving through an open air market, they're, they're looking, they're getting, not getting their lunch, and this came out of the, the French film, whereas they kind of go to a French market and they're getting you know, food and buying this and that and the other thing. And in terms of the script that I wrote, it was the same thing. They were at an open air market, they were doing this, they were getting that, um, and, and the, the whole idea of beating the fish was in the script, you know, where he got oh, so angry about it. But um, here's the funny thing is that in my mind, I would never have imagined what the director Joel Schumacher created in terms of that amazing market that he found. This move, movie was also shot in Vancouver. So, you know, that incredible market where it was busy and bustling and everything was everywhere. And, you know, that certainly came out of his production. You know, that, that came out of his vision of what, of what it should be. No, she won't. Please stop. Larry, no. Well, then, how about spending the rest of your life with me? What are you talking about? You know, I haven't hit another human being since the eighth grade, but if you want to fight, I will please, fight. Please, please. Fine. <laughs> What's going on here? Pa, please. We, I'm, I'm trying to make a little chicken salad out of chicken shit here. Maria, everyone is looking. Wait a minute. I've kept my part of the bargain for Chloe's sake. Well, maybe Chloe deserves more than a bargain, Tom. You come and get in the car with me right now, or I'm leaving you for good. Larry Kuzinski, I would love to dance with you. Please, everybody, dance! dance! I'm taking my present back.
Yes. Um, when in, in a situation like that, when you've got, um, I don't know how it winds up on the page when you're writing it. Then they go dance. Yeah. <laughs> but what the director did with those moments and the beats and allowing it to play out and fulfill the moment, you could tell. Okay, here's the pace. That's that's totally the director. So totally. I mean, what what did you write, and how did did you envision any action? Um, well, I I can't I I would have to look at the script, but I would imagine what it was is they take the stage or they go and they begin to dance. Other people start to fill the dance floor and dance. Um, but in terms of how he created the shots and the the, the people and the images and we didn't know, have any idea what the music would be at that point no so that's very very much what he did which is quite wonderful so you she's, put those, she's even got the i don't even know what i don't I, yeah. yeah so you put the you, you, you so when the director is reading your script they buy your script and they're going to make a movie out of it i mean do they have discussions with you or do they just go off on um, their own little mental state or i you know something I know they really don't. Um, they buy it, they're reading it. And they're uh, you know, let's put it this way. In this script, um, the director did, he did not buy it. It was, it was created by, you know, it was, it, was, the, the, it was optioned, set up by Paramount Pictures. Um, they said, okay, we're gonna go ahead. They hired uh, Joel Schumacher to direct it. Now, in the original script, the, the people, the women's name were, they were Kowalskis, they were Polish. And it was Joel's idea to hire Isabella Rossellini, in which case, all of a sudden, um, we got that wonderful Argentinian actress who played the mother, but I forgot what the name suddenly became. But, um, you know, so much of it, I would say, is that, you know, he, he's, all, Joel, he's also a writer, he considered himself. <laughs> and but there's no doubt in my mind that he would go and he would rewrite the scenes in his head and he would get a sense of of you know how is he going to translate that visual in his head you know I, I, I there's a big big difference I mean I, I think sometimes about the difference between being a writer director in theater a writer director in film a writer director in television um, I believe sometimes a director in theater is an interpretive artist. What I mean by that is you have a play, it's going to be done who knows how many times, and each time it's gonna be different because of the, the actors you have and because of the director you have. Um, in terms of a film, let's, no, let's go to television first. Um, television is an ongoing thing, and to me, television is, as often as not, is story-based and it's character-based. You have actors writing for very specific, excuse me, writers writing for actors who are playing characters. In a funny sort of way, the director has the least amount of input in television. In a, in a feature film, this movie might have went into pre-production, let's say went into pre-production in April. Um, it went into maybe shooting in June or July. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I was on to another project at that point. You know, I, I don't, I was at, I was invited to the set for like a long weekend. I had a lovely time and I met everybody. It was just great. And then I went back to whatever I was doing. And a year and a half later, the film came out. So the person who took that and carried it through was totally Joel Schumacher, the, the director. He was the one who took it through pre-production. He was the one who has, took it through shooting. He took it through post. So the, to me, the, the director in a feature film is, is the guy who, who carries it forward. That's why there can be so many writers on a feature film script. Um, and that's why I also say, though, as a director, you should make sure you read every single script that's ever been written on that project just to make sure you don't lose something wonderful that, that's been written along the way. As a corporate screenwriter, scriptwriter, um, I, I've worked with different directors and different writers, and 
you will get completely divergent points of view depending on the skill of the director on how much they want you to write about the scenes. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's an interesting thing as a, as a corporate writer where it's you know five minute piece. But you know sometimes I would get, uh, when I was running the video department at General Dynamics, I had a script writer that would just fill the page, the video side, with just so much detail and trying it literally, you know, tying the director's hands and the shooter's hands, you know, where they couldn't, you know. But if you got a beginning director or, be, you know, some, a cameraman that didn't really know what they were doing, they used that as the Bible, the, the description on the video side. Sure. So, I mean, it was, you just, you, you had to really balance who you were handing the script to to find out, you know, do you want a lot of detail or do you just want the, you know, the bare bones on what's happening on the video side? <laughs> You know, it, for a first draft of a screenplay these days is what I, I always refer to it as. It's like it's 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 a selling piece. You're you're writing something that it, it's like a hybrid. It's half novel, half screenplay. You know, you're you're writing something so people can read it and say, "Wow, this is a, what a great story. What great characters. I really really want to do this." If I was a director, I would then take it and I I would just cut that totally to the bone. Meaning, I don't want all that stuff. I, I would imagine a director wants to be able to look at it and say, okay, this is what I'm going to or do. the client could look at it and say, wow, then I can yeah. visualize what's happening. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's I, I really believe just because of the, I learned this directing my own film, which I thought, okay, this might, might not mean anything, but, I came into directing that film thinking I, I knew how to direct because I directed in the theater quite a lot. And um, I realized, looking back, I made a huge mistake, which is I was directing my scenes like a theater director as opposed to someone who was creating as much, and when I say I tried to create it like a theater director, I was trying to get the best enactment of that individual scene as if I was putting it in front of an audience. And later on I realized, what was I thinking? I should have been doing it 20 different ways. I should have been encouraging changes because I got into the editing room and I didn't have enough stuff to work with. It drove me nuts. I, and I suddenly thought, what was I thinking? I mean, I real, in retrospect, I look at the shoot now as something that should have been providing me with raw material for the editing room. And I didn't understand that. I did not understand that. What did you do different for Pretty Woman? Anything? I, I mean, I was just the writer on Pretty Woman. So, I mean, no, the only one I've directed is Beautiful Joe. And, and from, the, from Cousins to Pretty Woman, did you, was there was a period of time between those two? Uh, Pretty Woman would have been after Cousins. Pretty, you know, Pretty Woman is, I, I, I find it, it's, a, it's a funny situation. Pretty Woman was based on a film, uh, a script uh, called 3000 by a writer named Jonathan Lawton, J.F. Lawton. And um, it was a, if you were to read the script, you could probably get it online. It's called 3000. It is a very, very, very serious, dark, ugly telling of the same story. The character of Vivian is, is, she's a coke addict. She's a street walker. The guy who plays the Richard Gere character is this kind of Machiavellian, controlling individual. The, film, the best way to describe it is the film ends up with Hollywood Boulevard and she's tearing clothes out of her suitcase and throwing them at the limousine as he draws off into the night. And the last scene of it is she's sitting in a, in a cafe with her uh, fellow prostitute and they're getting ready to go out on the streets again. Whoever thought that film could be a romantic comedy, I have no idea. <laughs> but, but, but somebody did. And, um, and so they were interviewing writers for that and I'd been given the script and, they, and they were, I was just said, hey, they're, you know, they want to make this a romantic comedy. And I read this and I think, Jesus Christ. <laughs> And I, and I thought about it, and I'm, I maybe thank God for a theater background, but I went in, and uh, they said, well, what do you think? I said, well, I think it should be My Fair Lady. 
you know, Pygmalion. And it was like, it was the only time in my life where I've seen bells go off in everybody's head. And they suddenly said, oh, for Christ's sake, yes. And they, everybody got it immediately. So the, the rewrite that we then did was to take this very, very dark story and turn it, we turned it into My Fair Lady. What a great, that right there, that's worth the price of admission to listen to that story. Yeah, that, and that's really what it was. And, and the other crazy thing about Pretty Woman, which, you know, at that, at, at that point, was the biggest growth. Nobody knew anything. I guarantee you. Um, they had hired Gary Marshall, and Gary, who's the most wonderful, funny guy in the world, he would, this is what he would say. He would say, <laughs> if I can remember, I, I can't do it justice. I know it's there, but I can't find the funny. <laughs> That's what he would say, okay? And they'd hired Julia Roberts, who they knew, I think, was gonna be a huge star. And so she was there, and they had nobody for the Richard Gere role. And when I first came, when I came on and was in the process, they were trying to get Al Pacino to do that role. <laughs> and at one point, I kid you not, they packed us all up and flew us all to New York to do a reading of the script with Al Pacino, and it was so unbelievably horrible. But they were willing to perceive, and then he said no, and then the next person they asked was, um, what's his name, uh, Harrison Ford. Might have been a little better. And then they started talking about Sean Connery. And then they finally got to a point where we, you know, we were, they were, and they literally, as it was told to me, they quote unquote settled for Richard Gere. <laughs> and the title of the film came from the fact, I, I mean, I, and that, this is a point where they're into, in, they finished the shooting and this is like a good year after I've done anything and I get a call from the producer and she said, um, by the way, we're gonna call it Pretty Woman. And I said, why, really, that's okay. She said, no, the, Roy Orbis, the rights to the Roy Orbison film are available, and so we grabbed them. And so we think it'll make a good title. <laughs> was, it, was it still called 3000? Yes, right up to that point, it was called 3000. And so, so all these crazy things happen, and, um, and then the, you, we finally, as, as you're going into it, I started, I started getting sort of these odd little intimations that they were a little excited about it. Maybe they've been doing screenings, I don't know. But all of a sudden it was, uh, you know, it went off and going and everybody was very excited about it. So, I mean, but nobody expected, I guarantee you, I kid you not, no one ever thought it was going to be anything, knock your socks off. I have a question for you. Yes. In what you write, Is it the norm that what they produce from your material matches your vision of it, or is it like that's like a, a bolt of light that strikes out? Of um, in terms of scenes themselves, I was looking at some of those scenes. Uh, as often as not, the scenes sort of they play out the way I sort of see them. You know, I mean, in terms of the scenes, the dialogue scenes. Um, so, you know, but you see, there's the, there's the thing too, though, is that uh, I, I remember about a year and a half ago, two years ago, and maybe you guys read this, but there was some, t Michael Bay, as talking about himself as a director, said, I am one of the great creators of visual imagery in the world. <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, that, that would not work with what I'm doing, would it? I mean, it, you know. I, I, I sort of feel like a dime. I don't know if my stuff would ever work in, in, in film anymore. On the other end, you have, what, Silver Linings Playbook, yeah, which was sort of wonderful. Dialogue. Yeah, we could talk about what's wrong with that film, but we won't do that. And, uh, <laughs> but at the same time, those were really, they were really wonderful scenes, weren't they? And um, so I, I think that's still the theater person in me yeah. coming out about how, how do you construct a good scene between actors? You know, how do you make it work? How do you build that scene? How do you, how, you know, what is the structure of a good scene between people? Yeah, just a question, kind of close to his question, but how many of the screenplays that you say you've done where you watch the film later on and you look at it and it's, you think, that's exactly what I was thinking. That's the movie I wrote. 
Um, Does that happen very much? Well, you know something, I, I, I must say that I can't say it all it happens that way. You know, there are any number of moments where you think, well, that's not what I thought. Um, and there are moments where you do. But, you know, I always say this is that um, it, it, in terms of the film, things I, I've gotten credit for and the things that I haven't at least, you know, Two thirds of everything I've done are sitting on shelves in Hollywood, so it's hard to say. I mean, it's just really hard to say. I mean, you know, I, it, it, I, I consider it, it's a relatively limited resume, and yet it's probably considered a pretty good one in the context of, of the business that I work in. But, uh, you know, so it's hard. To say. I, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that. I wish I could. If I think if I'd worked in television more, I could be able to answer that you actually better. Answer. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Um, this diversion that you're referencing away from good screenwriting, script writing, and more towards the uh, flamboyance, do you feel as though that's being driven by the audience or by the production houses trying to make money off of all the merchandising and everything? I think it's I think it's all of the above, and I think um, I th you know it's interesting. I think I think we are at a um, a real changing point in terms of something. I think something great happened this year in film, which is the fact that I think. Um, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. No, I, I <laughs> in in my stu my stupid opinion. I, for the first time this year, really liked a lot of the movies that were, you know, nominated for Academy Awards and things. And I thought they were, they were, they seemed, they seemed serious movies. They seemed like there, there was resonance to them. And the fact that they did well, I think, bodes well for those of us who are interested in doing quote unquote serious movies. Um, I, I was really starting to. Uh, I was start. I was starting to mourn. <laughs> I mean, I'd go to the movies and I would be a third of the way. My daughter won't go to the movies with me because I start yelling at the screen. <laughs> and I said, you know, and I, she said, I was there. I said, oh, you've got to be kidding me, <laughs> Dad! Shut up. <laughs> so I don't know. This uh, maybe this this was a good thing that this happened this year. I think that. Maybe we're going to find more and more of this, but um, it's definitely, a, it's totally changed. You know, I, I do a fair amount of teaching um, in workshops and stuff with young people, and it's like, um, you know, they, they, I think they're getting it more, maybe, I don't see a lot of young people here. They're getting it more than we are. I'm so, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm talking about the 20-year-old, but they realize that they, they can make these, like, little, eight minute films and they know how to upload them and do all this, and I don't know how to do that at all. I wish I did, I don't get that. But I think a lot of that is, in fact, that's why you need to get more young people in here, maybe we'll all learn something from them, but. Uh, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I think, I, I, I think it's changing so remarkably. But you know, it's interesting, I have a daughter who, uh, she's 22, and from about the age of eight, she was a, she was a, uh, um, she was a movie fan. I mean, she watched, she saw everything. Everything. In fact, she'd see movies that I didn't think were appropriate. I said, oh, come on. She wanted to see everything. She was a movie maniac. And all of a sudden, about 19, she stopped watching movies. And I said, let's go, let's go to see. Uh, yeah. You know, so I don't know what to say. I don't, I don't know where movies are going these days. I really wish I did. I'm frustrated by that. Well, we all grew up on dialogue-driven yeah. movies that were directly from the stage. And it was all about character and dialogue. And right? it was a sensibility. There were no special effects. Yeah. It was all dialogue it and story. Was story. It was a story. Yeah. I, I absolutely believe that, uh, you know, I, can, I get dragged into some of these, you know, smash them up whodunits. And I want to say, well, it's, it's masterful. I mean, I don't even know how you do that, but boy, give me somebody to care about and I would be so much more excited about this. I probably shouldn't mention The Walking Dead. Oops. 
<laughs> but I watched the recent episode. Wow. All right. It talked about it, there was something really special going on in terms of because they're basically at war. And the interpersonal relationships are not just based on the fact that I'm good or you're bad or you're not as good or you're not as bad or you're a little bit crazy or whatever. They're in wartime and wow, they got really good. I mean, interpersonal. And, but you see, that I, I, get, I think that's absolutely right. But part of that is in the context of a series the focus is on creating characters that we can identify with and care about, and then we follow them yeah, so you come back. on those adventures, and we come back. And we, you know, the the, the real um, challenge in, of doing something in ninety minutes or one hundred twenty minutes is how do we create characters we want to follow on that journey? Um, did we see that film? Uh, gosh, how can I forget the name of it? Because I loved it. The Austrian director, the two French, I mean, the old war. Oh, I, that just destroyed me. Yeah. My, my daughter didn't like it at all, but I loved it. I just loved it. Too many words. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, right. Let's show yeah. the last Pretty one. Well. Yeah. Pretty well. <laughs> Wake up, time to shop. Now, if you have any trouble using this card, have them call the hotel, all right? Oh, more shopping. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised you didn't buy more than one dress yesterday. It wasn't as much fun as I thought it was going to be. Why not? They were mean to me. Mean to you? People are looking at me. They're not looking at you. They're looking at me. The stores are not nice to people. I don't like it. Go back for one stores. second there. Have you, have you guys noticed that what was done there in a one shot, if you did that today, you would probably have about 20 cuts? You know, uh, yeah, just yeah. notice oh, that. It's 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 oh, it would have, it would have been. It, yeah, I, I just want to mention that. That's all. I'm so never nice to people. They're nice to credit cards. Okay. Stop fidgeting. Get rid of your gum. I don't believe you did that. <clears throat> yes, I am Mr. Hollister, the manager. May I help you? Edward hey, Lewis. Yes. You see this young lady? This guy right here was my roommate for four years in New York City. Is <laughs> <laughs> it Larry Miller? Larry Miller. <laughs> and he didn't know I, he didn't even, we never knew he was doing this. Until oh. he, yeah. Yes. You see this young lady over here? Yes. Do you have anything in this shop as beautiful as she is? Oh, yes. Oh, no. No, no, no. I'm saying we have many things as beautiful as she would want them to be. That's the point I was getting at. And I think we can all agree with that. That's why when you came Excuse in here, you know what we're going to need from here? the first. We're going to need a few more people helping us out. I'll tell you why. We're going to be spending an obscene amount of money in here. So we're going to need a lot more help sucking up to us because that's what we really like. Oh. You understand that? Sir, if I may say so, you're in the right store and the right city, for that matter. Anything you see here, we can do, by the way. Get ready to have some fun, okay? Okay. Mary Pat, Mary Kate, Mary Frances, Tova, let's see it. Come on, bring oh, it up. This is absolutely divine. Yeah. Excuse me, yeah. sir. Uh, yeah. Exactly how obscene an amount of money were you talking about? Just profane or really offensive? Really offensive. I like him so much. How's it going so far? Pretty well, I think. I think we need some major sucking up. Very well, sir. You're not only handsome, but a powerful man. I could see the second you walked in here, you were someone to reckon with. Hollister. Yes, sir. Not me. Her. I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry. How are we doing, ladies? <laughs> That's what everybody needs to have on their shelves. Yeah. It's a good movie. Yeah.
I'd like to ask you another question. You mentioned earlier when we first started that uh, a lot of times you'd be brought on to work the dialogue. Mm -hmm. What were you seeing that was lacking in the dialogue that you had to go rework, and what did you put in to make it better? Um, I can't say it was exactly dialogue. Um, Explain this. I mean, the, the, sometimes people would come. You'd get hired, and we literally we want you to make it better, <laughs> and um, and you could understand what they were saying, and what that meant was that you, the story was very very good, and yet there was something flat. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, the very very first thing that that. First project anybody ever gave me to do um, was, let me see if I can kind of do it quickly. It was about these two guys on a boat who got sent to smuggle something out of Cuba. Not something I would ever have really wanted to do, but somebody was paying me, you know, $12,000 to do it. Now, when in, in the context of what I was given, these two guys were buddies. Okay, from the very, very beginning. And it suddenly seemed like, well, this is stupid. So, for example, what I did, I say, no, these are two guys who don't know each other, who get thrown together and don't really like each other very, very much. So, right from the beginning, it created a sense of conflict between the characters that I think was both funny and also gave you a place to begin from and a place to move to. Okay, it was something like that. I, I, and, and it seemed to work pretty well. Um, so that's an example. Um, the ability to write character is a very, I think, a very, very, um, it, it's a talent. You know, uh, what, what is it about somebody who writes a character on the page and all of a sudden you, the character just jumps off the page and somebody who does it and it doesn't? I, I couldn't even begin to explain that. But they're always looking, you know, people are always looking for something that makes the character go boom. Um, I, I don't even know. You know, and I, I, I work with a lot of young writers in, in workshops and things and some people seem to possess the ability to create a character that you get that as an actor you would get, and some people do not, and I could not even begin to explain that. I saw a play last week where the lead one of the lead characters was an upper crust British um, uh, capitalist. Yes. Who was, but the director and the, the actor, it was a preview, it was a, still a rehearsal, but he came off as a buffoon instead of, you know, so the dialogue was the same because it's, you know, it's a play, yeah. the, the words are there, but, but it's one of those things where it could have been either way, just depending on the way the actor, you know, interprets those words, Absolutely. But, when, but when it's a little bit more well written, and then you don't have to dig so hard to find the character. Yeah. I, that's what you are skilled at. So there are people who are. I find myself in Costco, people watching, Home Depot, people watching. Of course. Um, to get inspired for characters, what do you do? Boy. <laughs> you know, you, you can create... It's a stumper. I mean, um, you know, here's the thing too: is that let, let's put it this way: a, a quote-unquote character in a play and a character in a screenplay. They, it is a heightened reality. It, dialogue is heightened. The, the the situation is heightened, and 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 how you create that heightened sense of something and still kind of make it. Um, I don't know, seem normal. You know, movies are the best parts, aren't they? You know, I always, 
that's what we like about movies. It's it's the best parts of everything. We don't we, we don't get to see <laughs> when James Bond jumps from London to, to Singapore. We don't get to see the plane ride. <laughs> we did, all of a sudden they're in Singapore. You know, we don't see him going to the toilet. Exactly, yeah, but you know what I'm saying, and, so, and it's the same thing in terms of dialogue. I mean, you know, I'm always saying to, to playwriting students, conversation and dialogue are not the same thing. They are not the same thing at all. So it's, I, I don't know how to answer that question. We, we, one of the exercises that we'll do in a, in a playwriting class is, and it's great with young college kids, is that, um, We'll take, in the first class, I'll take two um, of the students. I usually take two of the, the women. And I'll say, okay, you are meeting your friend at Starbucks. Okay? I just want you to impro improvise meeting at Starbucks. And they'll come <coughs> around and they'll do that, 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 you know. Okay. They'll do that. Then I'll take one person aside and I will say, okay, this is your best friend, and you just heard she's sleeping with your boyfriend. I want you to do the same improv right now. And they'll do the same thing again, and it changes completely because of what the one person is bringing to it. And then I'll take the second person aside and I'll say, you're sleeping with her boyfriend, and you don't know whether she knows yet or not, and you're terrified she might find out, and then we'll do the improv a third time. And it's amazing what what go what starts as quote unquote conversation, okay? Meaning, oh, I think I'll have a latte. How's your class? Blah 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 blah. All of a sudden, becomes something a little different because somebody has an, an agenda, and then something becomes something totally different. Everything is like is loaded because both people have an agenda, and all of a sudden, conversation becomes dialogue. Does that make any sense? What's your, what's your physical process? Do you sit down and just start writing a movie? Do you write a, a, an outline or a character analysis? Um, or? That's an interesting question. Um, I, um, I, I, I feel like I wasted a lot of time in my life saying, I quote unquote, discover my story, okay? And what, when I was in my, about the age of 40 something, I ended up working with a producer who uh, I got hired to do something and he said, okay, I want an outline. <laughs> and I said, I don't do outlines. He said, I want an outline. I know. I, it's, I, I'll put it in the contract. I want an outline. And I want a 20 page outline. <laughs> and I said, I don't. <laughs> okay. It was the most excruciating <laughs> three weeks of my life <laughs> trying to create this effing outline. And I turned it in to him, and we sat down, and we went through it, and we chatted about it, and I ended up writing the screenplay based on the outline in about three weeks. And I just thought, what have I been doing my entire <laughs> life? <laughs> okay? And, I, and so what I mean by that now is that I, I don't, as a playwright, I, I want my, I want to sort of discover sometimes where my people take me, but I, I've become very, very much old to a place where I think to myself, um, I'm starting in California, and I know I want to end up in New York. God, why would I want to go to Miami? No, I want to, I, I, I need to have a sense of what my route is, okay? I, I maybe don't do it as specific as that producer asked me to do it, but I really make a point of knowing what my story is um, now before I get into it. And I find it so helpful. And I also find um, in, in looking at other people's work and analyzing work, a basic, has everybody read, God, I hate that, but Robert McKee's book about story, I think is so, remarkable because he really talks about the basics of story structure. And I think that story structure works for plays. I think it works for fiction. I think it works for, for movies. 
it, it literally talks about the idea of setup, inciting incident, you know, escalating co conflict, crisis climax resolution. And it is a basic structure of, I think, of all really good, good stories. So if you haven't read, the, read it, you really should read it. I mean, it, some of it, it takes you off in 27 different directions, but his basic breakdown of story structure is, is just great. It really is good. Called it's just called Story it's by Robert, Robert McKee. Story. 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 Yeah. It'll be in the recap. Yeah. If, if you've seen the movie Adaptation, he is portrayed by an actor. Yeah. But that's Bob McKee. He's one of the two. He's one of the, he's one of the big, the, the gurus of, who's the other, is Sidney, um, I don't know. But he, the, he, 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 Sidfield. But I, I have to say that yeah, sit, sit, feel, sit, feel. when I, I, I really think th that that book I found enormously helpful in terms of just the whole basic structure of of good of good story of screen story of any story. Of, I mean, I, I talk about that now in terms of plays. I talk about it in terms of, of fiction. I mean, it really it makes a lot of sense. Do you do your playwriting seminars here? I do. Um, I usually do them down at Malelo Theater in downtown San Diego. Yeah. So you get uh, hired, obviously, to do a lot of rewrites. Are you what's considered a script doctor, or is that a different? I, 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 I was for a long time, and um, and I think in in retrospect, I would say, say to you that that was a good thing and a bad thing, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. The good thing is that. Um, I made a nice career out of it, um, and around about, I guess about maybe 10 years ago, I, I literally suddenly, I just, I, I just got hit with this thing is that I could, I could not keep doing other people's work anymore. I wasn't doing any of my own work. And I literally sort of took a big step back and, um, it was very. It was very, very interesting. I mean, when you're suddenly not working in the context of the quote-unquote industry, when you're not working with people up there, you know, it's not as it's. It ain't easy. You guys all know that. It ain't easy. But at the same time, I, I feel like the work I'm doing now is is um, the fact that I didn't do my own work for a while means that I'm, I find myself really. Excited about doing my own work now, so I'm I, as I, I think I was telling somebody I'm I'm doing writing plays again, and I'm working on a novel, and I don't think unless somebody came to me and said, uh, you know, we want you to do the screenplay, I don't know if I would write a spec screenplay ever again. Would you say that by being like a script doctor and having a chance to see other people's work and in comparison, you know, did that help? Oh boy. Um, I would have to say no. And here's the thing: is that as a script doctor, you you go. You know, I, this is a horrible thing to say, but I had a I had a my, my agent one time, who was a just a great guy, and you know, it, as as most agents seem to be in L.A., he was a very you know very, very Jewish guy. He said to me once, if Adolf Hitler came to town with a good script, we'd get in line to represent him. And I said, oh my God. What he was literally saying is that they are, people, they are dying for story. Story is what makes things work. And when you rewrite other things, you're not creating your own stories. You're, you're, you're rewriting other people's stories. Uh, and I think that is problematic and that oddly enough over the last 10 years um, when I'm now focusing on my own stories again well I'm not you know I'm not working as much in the in, in that industry in the industry but I'm mu as a as a writer I'm much more excited and more gratified by what I'm doing so I, I, I don't know how to answer that question I mean maybe that does I don't know how much input do you have or did you have as a writer in Can, can, none. Can good, none? <laughs> none. Can good writing say bad acting, or can good acting say bad script? Uh, well, I go. I keep going back to that William Goldman thing. Have you ever, have you ever read notes in the screen uh, screen trade, 
where he says that, you know, if you have a good script and you have the right cast, maybe you'll have a good movie. Um, I, I go back to Beautiful Joe. I mean, um, Sharon Stone is a really, really talented actress. She's not a comedic actress. And the reason she's not a comedic actress is she doesn't know how to react. She acts, she pushes, but she does not ho know how to react. And if you really were ever look at that movie, the humor in that her character comes from reacting to, to something she doesn't understand. And she never got that. We talk about it all the time. You know, wait, he's throwing you a curveball. You gotta react to the curveball. She couldn't do that. I mean, and that's not, it's just that not something she could do. Um, well, when you write your, your characters, you have in mind what you think would be a good, a good actor or, or someone you have who can deliver these lines in the way that you think this is what makes it funny? Uh, um, I, I don't, I, maybe I used to, but really I don't anymore. I mean, when we were working on Pretty Woman and they literally asked me to do a pass on the script based on the reading with Al Pacino, meaning can you get his rhythms? Can you get, you know, and he was so distinctive that it was very, very easy to get those rhythms. Um, I, the, the movie, uh, It Could Happen to You, which was based on a, a screenplay called um, Pop Gives Waitress, uh, I don't know, $7 million tip. We had this lovely, we had a love, we created a lovely screenplay, again, stupid stories, and I get a call that Arnold Schwarzenegger read the script and likes it. <laughs> and so I'm invited to, uh, down to his office in Santa Monica, and it is, I get there, and every single bigwig from Sony is down there, and we sit down, and they're all in suits, and he's in shorts. And um, they discussed, how do you make this script now for, for, so I literally got hired to write a pass of the script for him, for that character, uh, for that voice, for, you know, for things that he thought might make that work. And, uh, and then he went off and did something else. <laughs> It, it, no, it turned out to be Brid, uh, turned out to be Bridget Fonda and uh, Nicholas Cage. Yeah. So, so I I, I can't say I, I when when people are when 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 people in terms of the rewriting stuff when when they're talking about specific people you have a sense of what that energy might be as an actor but when you're doing original work no I don't think you do it all. Well, j just as you're saying, I, there was a, a time long ago, long ago, there was a time when I really just said, okay, I'm going to let them show me where to go. I, don't, I really don't do that anymore. I, I, I do have a sense of a path before I go. And, uh, and the reason I, I do that now is because I, I realize that if you have a path, I find it very easy. I can wander off the path, but if I get lost, then I can always find myself back to the path again. Whereas if I get lost and I have no path, I'm lost. You know? What do I do now? Yeah, what do I do now? I also suggest to you that one of the things about writing is uh, when, you, when you get lost, throw, leave the computer and go to a notepad. Yeah, you can see things. Yeah, because when, when, you, when you're working with a computer, there's a tendency to start just what I call juggling words. Yeah. They disappear. Whereas when, you know, nobody wants to go back and scratch out. So you, writing with a pad makes you keep moving forward. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. Yes. If we want to go to one of your seminars, would we go to your uh, blog online or would we, would we go to your website and sign up? How um, would we go to your seminars? It would be just, um, it'd be the Muleilo Theater downtown, which is M O O O. L E L O, and I should also say that you know it's it's we we mostly focus on um, it's mostly writing for the theater, but there are a lot of people who also want to write for screen and want to come in and you know write a, you know they want to focus on developing character and dialogue and things like that. So. M O O M O O 
L E L O, which is actually a really interesting theater downtown. Now it's on 10th and Broadway, and uh, they do a lot of really good work. Yeah. We focus socially conscious equity theater company. Exactly. Uh, I'm going to wrap up the questions with what has been your worst moment professionally and what has been your best moment professionally? Oh, my gosh. I don't know. Um, when you were talking, you were talking earlier on about your worst moment. My worst moment. Just to be clear, that wasn't nearly my worst moment. Okay. <laughs> that was his first worst moment. Um, my, my worst moment was... Um, getting hired by some people to do a TV, a TV pilot. They wanted me to write a TV pilot, and they wanted it to be on, and this would have been in the mid to late 90s, they wanted it to be on um, lobbying firms in Washington. And I said, well, that sounds interesting, and but I I said, I don't know anything about that. And they said, well, we'll figure. And so they sent me to, uh, to Washington, D.C., and I met with people, and, and I did this, and I, I got all sorts of good characters. And I, but I came back and I said, I have no idea where I could take this. And they said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. And we're going to set you up. We're going to do a pitch. And they dragged me into um, a network, and we did a pitch. And I had no idea what I was, and it was like, it was so embarrassing. I just thought, uh, well, and they'd ask questions and I didn't have the answer. And it was, that was probably the worst, that was, that might've been the worst moment to, to go into something so unprepared, so. Did that end up being K Street, the George Clooney? No, that was years that? later. Yeah, nice, so. And best? Best, I don't know. I'm not very good at thinking of the best things. Um, <laughs> no, not at all. I think some of the best things, you know, have been when, I, if, if, truth be known, my, my best um, experiences have been in the theater, uh, where a performance of a play went especially well, and the sense of, you know, camaraderie and the sense of, uh, of you know, a job well done by all of us created something special. Uh, th those would be the moments to me that have, uh, you know, have been the, those have, are the most memorable moments, for sure. I think we've had a ball trip.